My name is Chris Rich. I am the CEO and Executive Director of the National Celiac Association. I welcome all of you and I thank you for putting some time into your busy schedules to join us this evening. Uh, the National Celiac Association, we educate, advocate, and empower individuals, families, and communities uh, who are affected by celiac disease and non-celiac gluten sensitivities. Um, we're soon going to surpass 70 support networks across the country. Um, this includes our Raising Celiac Kids program, which directly assists kids and families um, all across the country. Other programs include our Supporting Celiac Seniors Initiative and our Feeding, our feeding Gluten-Free program, uh, which has delivered gluten-free food to food pantries in over 3,000 communities across the United States. Um, you can find more about those programs and our other programs and initiatives at our website at nationalceliac.org. So some housekeeping items before we get started here. Uh, we want tonight to be equally an informal discussion as well as an educational event. Um, you're welcome to ask general questions through the Q&A feature, which is located at the bottom right corner of your Zoom screen. Uh, the format for the evening, we're going to do a, a short presentation. We're going to have that from our speaker, uh, Dr. Dina Abbey. Uh, following that, Dr. Abby and I, we're going to be addressing some of the questions that you've previously sent in, and then we'll be answering some questions that you submit throughout the uh, through that Q&A box in that bottom right corner. Uh, the wonderful staff at uh, the National Celiac Association is going to be answering some questions as they come in as well, so hopefully we'll be able to address as many of these as we can. Uh, closed captioning is also available by clicking that CC button on the bottom lower part of your screen, um, and this discussion is also being recorded. It will be available for viewing on our website by Monday, so you can have it all prior to your holiday for reference. And that address uh, for the website, again, nationalceliac.org. You're going to also get an email from us um, that'll have that link in it to the recording. Look for that email to hit your inbox on Monday. So let's get the festivities started. Uh, let's do it by introducing our presenter for tonight's discussion, uh, Dr. Dina Abbey. Dina is a licensed clinical and school psychologist specializing in working with children and families. Uh, she has over a decade of experience successfully diagnosing, treating, and helping children and families live with ADHD, autism, depression, anxiety, OCD, feeding, feeding concerns, and more. Um, Dr. Abby has several members of her family who have celiac disease, and she was a featured speaker at the 2018 Generation GF Teen and Family Summit. She was also a board member at the Gluten Intolerance Group, and I am super proud to have her as a colleague and even more proud to call her a friend. So without further ado, welcome, Dina. Thanks, Chris. Thanks yeah, for so, Appreciate it. Thanks. So um, I, I'm looking forward to a great conversation. I'm looking forward to, to talking about this stress during the holidays, and especially with those of us in our community, can be uh, very overwhelming. Um, so I, I want to get started by putting a poll question up. Um, I want to see you know, how are you going to be celebrating your holidays? Are you going to be traveling? Is it going to a restaurant or hosting other? So Dina, what about you? What are you doing for Thanksgiving? Oh, I'm I'm actually leaving. Uh, my family and I leave and we we go on a mini vacation every year. So we're going out. Nice. Very yeah. Nice. What about you? What are you up to? We're open housing it. So uh, we pretty much said anyone who wants to stop by that afternoon, come by um, with the older kids coming home and, you know, them doing their own things, et cetera. We just said, you know what? We're not going to put a time on it this is when we'll have turkey ready. So we'll see who shows up. <laughs> yeah, nice. So yeah, so let's see, can we see a, uh, what do we got for a, um, all right, we got 44% of the people are traveling, 40% hosting, 17% um, with the other and six going to a restaurant. So that's a great, uh, uh, you know, it's a great uh, spread of the numbers. You know, we have people hosting, we have people who are, are traveling. So I think there's a lot of things that we'll talk about today that's going to be helpful for everyone on board here. So I'll, let, I'll, I'll step aside, go ahead and let you get started. So thank you again. No problem. My pleasure. Okay, here we go. Yeah, pull it up. Okay, so I just wanted to I appreciate everybody for inviting me and showing up to my talk. We're going to talk about how to address address anxiety before the holiday celebration. So really, how to have your gluten-free cake and enjoy eating it too. Because there is a way to have a stress-free Thanksgiving and holiday celebration. So I wanted to talk firstly on why we stress during the holiday season. And there are multiple reasons. It's never just one, right? We have family. We stress about food, especially those of us with food allergies or celiac disease. We stress about travel and how that's going to work. We stress about accommodating ourselves, accommodating other people, all those family and friendship dynamics and relationships that occur, family obligations, things we have to do, things we want to do, 
So there's there's so many reasons, multiple multitude of reasons that we stress over the holidays. And we experience holiday stress in many, many ways. Stress produces cortisol, which is a hormone that's made by the adrenal gland, which is this tiny little gland that's found right above our kidneys. This acts as a built-in alarm system for the body. It kicks in that system, sympathetic nervous system, right? Which oversees that fight, flight, freeze, or fawn response that like, oh my God, um, or I have to run away, or um, I, I don't know what to do and I'm so overwhelmed. That cortisol is the one that kind of kicks that off. So cortisol, cortisol and epinephrine together, here's what they cause the heart to beat faster, our breathing speeds up, the blood vessels in our arms and our legs dilate, which encourages us to run away, or should we need to run away? Again, think that fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And our digestive processes slow down because the energy is being directed elsewhere in our body. And our glucose, which feeds the energy in the bloodstream is increased because that's what feeds all the other bodily functions. What about you guys? I wonder where you guys feel um, your holiday stress in your body. It's important to remember that if we can be in tune with our stress, we know where it first starts, then we can do something about it. So it's about being mindful of of where we physically feel it. These are some of the more common areas. So let me know when you guys have an answer. Oh, yeah, most of us feel it in our tight shoulders or our back. Absolutely, that's a, a lot of times where it kind of sits with us. So when we can feel it kind of everything kind of just hangs there, right? Um, a lot of us get headaches, our jaw clenches, right? Grind our teeth, oftentimes stomach aches. And once our stomach aches, kind of our whole system is all messed up. So we have to really be careful with what we eat and how we eat. And then, you know, other various ways that our body responds and reacts to stress. So it's not unheard of. Cortisol is one of the stress hormones that regulates also the immune system and affects inflammation. So the more stressed we are, the more our immune system comes into play and our body gets inflamed, right? Chronic stress is too much and too much cortisol. It impairs the communication between the immune system and the brain. So yes, being stressed around the holidays can make you more likely to get sick. We feel things more, especially pain when we're stressed. It's like you have a frayed nerve. And so once those endings, those nerve endings are all exposed, you're gonna feel other things more deeply than you would necessarily if they weren't exposed. Stress also affects how quickly food moves through the body, it induces muscle spasms, and it affects which nutrients are absorbed by the intestines. If you think about it, that's part of the reason that we get stomach aches when we're stressed. Stress can also increase or decrease our appetite, and it can cause out to seek different comfort foods, pretzels, um, soup, cheesecake, which I have right here, um, which may or may not make us feel better in the long run. So the more cheesecake you have, you might not feel so good in the morning. And then those unhealthy diets, along with all of the fun holiday foods that we don't necessarily eat every day, that might be filled with more carbohydrates and more sugar, can lead to mood changes and behavioral changes, right? Because more um, simple carbs and sugar, our, our blood sugar raises, and it's, it's, uh, we get a sugar high and we get all manic and then we crash, right? And then our behavior changes and we're low and then we get hangry and we seek another sugar high to bring it up and 
We just kind of go on that roller coaster of moods and behavior. All of this make us less available to use any strategies that we might have to handle the holiday stress. So what are some of the ways that we experience holiday stress? Elevated cortisol levels also bring about huh, disrupted sleep patterns, headaches, like we said, inflammation, reduced pain tolerance, shortness of breath. So the increased stress leads to the activation again of that sympathetic nervous system, which then leads to that increased production of cortisone levels, right? Which then goes back to the increased stress. So it just becomes this big circle. But there are things that we can do. So I wonder what are some things that you guys do proactively before maybe even that big meal where we get together with everybody to help you handle the stress. It used to be dessert before dinner for me. I will admit there are some cookies out there. I just can't, <laughs> can't hold back with. Doctor, I have a question real quick while we're getting the yeah. poll answers coming in. So I know when I'm excited about something, I get, you know, there's like a little nervous excitement, like before I have to do something or, or talk in front of or go into a meeting or whatever. And my stomach starts to hurt, starts to churn. Is that yeah. considered stress? Is that like positive stress? Well, if you think about it, there's no difference between positive stress and negative stress. It's all increased arousal. We determine whether or not it's positive or negative. That's a label that we as people put on it. So it's our body just knows it as increased arousal. So that cortisol level is going to be increased, whether it's excitement and it's something happy like a birthday party um, or it's something we're stressed about, like hosting a Thanksgiving meal. OK, thank you. Yeah, but. That's awesome. If everybody could anticipate the unexpected, that would be fabulous. That's a really great way to be able to handle the stress. If you don't go in with anything, um, with expecting things to go a certain way and demanding that things go a certain way, you're much more likely to be less stressed throughout your holiday meal. Um, exercising always helps. Definitely those turkey trots um, are worth more than just getting in those extra calories. Um, they help even you out and those neurotransmitters get kicking and you're able to handle a lot more going forward. So also something really good. Okay, so here are some things that we can do. If you have a plan beforehand, you're much more likely um, to be able to handle whatever comes your way. For example, know where you're going and know when you're going, right? I'm going to show up at two o'clock and I'm going to show up to this person's house instead of loosey goosey. Oh, we'll figure it out the day of. Definitely more stress. Know your, your allies. Who are your friends when you're there? Who are people you can trust with your food, with your kids' food? Um, even knowing like I can, I know this person's refrigerator and I can put it there and it'll be safe. Know the menu. So if you communicate and talk to the people beforehand, uh, here's what I'm bringing, you know, here's what they're making. What can I bring or what can I bring that mimics it? You'll feel more comfortable. So you can bring your own food or you can offer to make food that you trust. Again, these are the things that are within your control. So the more you have within your control, the calmer you'll be. Definitely know the plan for the day. That's important, right? If everybody's leaving at 12, make sure that you also are leaving at 12, right? You get out with everybody else. You know, everyone's going to play football. You're going to go out and play football, whatever it is. Know your plan. And this is really important too. You have to know how to make an exit. <laughs> even if it's from a conversation. I always tell the kids that I work with, there is nothing wrong with saying, oh, I'll be right back. I have to go to the bathroom. And if that means you just sit in the bathroom for a little bit until you calm down or the person leaves, that's okay. So 
it's okay to make an exit from a conversation. And it's okay to know that like at five o'clock, the meal's kind of over. You've been there since 12. It's a long day. Everybody's melting down. Time to go. Who are you going to say goodbye to first? How are you going to leave? Um, it's important to know how to make an exit. You'll feel better again, the more you plan. Also, we don't want to leave the host out because it's not just stressful for the people attending. It's also stressful for the people who are hosting, especially if they're not used to cooking for someone who has some gluten concerns. So, so important to communicate. Um, it's important to ask your guests what ingredients or brands are safe, how comfortable they are with eating food that is prepared in your house with your utensils, and if they say they're not, it's not indicative on their friendship or their appreciation of you, but it's, it's okay to accept their level of comfort. Different people have different levels. It's okay. And they would appreciate it if they say, I'm not, can I bring my own food? The fact that you're willing to host them sometimes means the world to them. Some people will say, hey, no problem. I love this brand and if you buy it, I'm good, you don't even have to do anything, it's fine. Then you know what to do, but if you don't communicate, then nobody, nobody knows what to do, how to do it, and again, that arousal level, those stress levels go right up. Also, if you're the host, really important to label what's gluten-free and what's not, and try and keep it separate. So easy for people to go, oh, what's that? and take their own fork and spoon, and now it's contaminated, and people aren't gonna wanna eat that. Um, so if you can keep it separate and keep it labeled so people know, the people who need it that are gluten-free, they will feel more comfortable and you will feel more comfortable. And that's also true with the utensils. Um, you might think that utensils aren't contaminated, but many of us with celiac are much more comfortable with our own utensils. It's no thought. So if these mashed potatoes are gluten-free and they have their own utensils that we don't have to worry about, we know it's safe. But again, you have to communicate. That's the key to everything. And then just to be understanding and calm, the calmer you are, the more you can intake the information that's being given to you, that's being communicated to you, the calmer everyone around you will be because you're the barometer for the party that you're hosting. So what are some of the ways that you guys find it's easiest to communicate with people, especially when it comes to your, your food needs and dietary concerns? So Dr. Abby, I think you brought up a good point um, with your previous slide. And we were talking about this uh, with a group earlier and how important it is to have an ally or a wingman with you. You know, somebody who you know, understands what you're going through, someone who is able to potentially help you navigate, but also provide you that exit strategy that you were talking about. Um, I, I think that's a that's something that uh, we we talked about again uh, earlier, and we said was so important and it's so helpful when you get in a stressful situation such as that. It, it is. It's it's nice to be able to turn to someone. I I know that I go to one particular family member's house um, when my kids are with me. We all know that she means well, but every time anyone, including herself, eats the food that she makes, they all get sick. So we know what she makes, we ask beforehand, we make a really big deal about it, we put it on our plates and we just don't touch it. It looks like we ate it, nobody knows, right? But we're all in it together. Um, we're each other's allies. Yeah, if polling works for everybody, that's the best way to communicate then. It's not about what, sometimes it's not really about what you're comfortable with. It's really about what the person you're communicating is comfortable with. And it's about making sure that the information that needs to get where it gets, gets to where it gets. So communicate, communicate, communicate. So there are lots of ways that we can handle holiday stress. So important to adjust expectations I know you want something to happen, but it may not always happen that way. And so if we can adjust our expectations, we won't 
feel the need to have a round peg fit in a square hole and we'll feel much better and everyone around us will feel better. Be self-aware. So we have to know how stressed we are and how our body's feeling and what we're projecting around to the other people so that we can adjust ourselves and modify our own behavior to help everybody around us. Because if we're not okay, nobody around us is gonna be okay. For example, are you reaching for your 15th holiday cookie? How often are you going to the bathroom? So if you find that you're really stress eating and, and you're in the bathroom a lot and your stomach really isn't, isn't feeling well or your shoulders are all the way up by your ears, you're probably showing that behaviorally too. Other people notice that and they're reacting to it. Again, if you're calm, you're going to be able to help other people around you be calm and you're going to be able to stay calm and remain calm. Sorry about this. <laughs> <laughs> um, adjust your expectations. The holidays are not always the season of gratitude and happiness and light. And if you know that and you're prepared for it, you will feel better. And everyone again around you will feel better. You know what you want. You know, you feel like it should be a Hallmark movie. It's not. It's okay. If you don't expect everything to go perfectly, you'll be able to go with the flow. One of the best quotes I recently heard was someone saying, when it rains, I let it. There are things in life I can't control, so I might as well just let things happen. And that's okay. So again, here are some more ways that we can handle holiday stress. Important to put boundaries in place with a smile. It's okay if somebody is really pushy and they keep saying, no, what can I make? What can I make? And you say, I've got this. I appreciate your help. Thank you so much. I'm bringing my food. Smile. That's okay. If you're firm but kind, people will respect you. And if they don't and they keep pushing, that's on them. You know your boundaries and what you're comfortable with. And that's okay. It's okay to say no. If people are demanding and you keep saying no, it's okay. There's nothing wrong with you. You have to be comfortable. It's your body or it's your child's body or your family member or your partner's body, it's okay to say, no, I cannot do this. It's okay to redirect a conversation. We're not talking about this now, or, hey, look, did you see the squirrel that just passed by? Whatever it is. You don't have to continue talking about something that makes you uncomfortable. There's nothing wrong with redirecting a conversation. It's even okay to have topics you will not talk about. And you can simply say, nope, that's on my like, no list for today. Let's talk about something else. Again, it's really okay to know how and when to make a timely exit. You'll feel better all around and have way less arousal if you know how and when to leave. It's also really important to know that just because someone says something doesn't make it true. If you're not comfortable with something, whether it's they made food for you and you're not comfortable with it, or I went to a, a concert recently and someone was adamant that a particular beer was gluten-free and I knew it was not. I just said, oh, okay, that's nice. And I still didn't drink it. Just because someone says something doesn't mean it's true. Not everyone is an expert. And just because they think they are, doesn't make it true. In the same vein, your response doesn't have to be obnoxious. Sometimes it's better to be nice rather than right. Oh, that's nice. How interesting. And it ends. You don't have to correct them. Saying okay goes a very long way. So, here are some other ways that we can stay and remain calm throughout our holiday season. Plan stress relief activities for yourself. Again, if you're not okay, nobody else is going to be okay. Kind of like putting the mask over yourself first before you attend to the kids. Vigorous exercise. I like to say three times a week for 30 minutes, 
and you sweat so much that you have to wash your hair with shampoo. That kind of vigorous exercise because it kicks those neurotransmitters into place and you just are able to have more emotional stability and calm through it. It carries throughout the days. It's not just one day. So that vigorous exercise is so important. I am a huge fan of mindfulness. Mindfulness is not meditation. Meditation is just a technique within mindfulness. Mindfulness is the ability to take whatever life throws at you and accept whatever comes at you without judgment. It is what it is. It's not good. It's not bad. It just is what it is. It's, a, it's about awareness without judgment. Meditation is a way to help us be mindful and be more aware without judgment. Oftentimes it's about, or one of the easiest ways, and even little kids can do this, practice focusing on one thing over another. And there are tons of ways that, that we can do that and we can practice it. But if we do this before we go anywhere, we're able to take that calmness with us whenever we go. 478 breathing, that's another technique. These are all kind of breathing techniques. So you breathe in for four, you hold it for seven, you breathe out for eight. Um, those numbers aren't important. It's just breathing in for a short time, holding it for longer and breathing out for even longer. That helps us, it's a form of diaphragmatic breathing. Cyclic breathing, there's some really cool studies that are coming out now with cyclic breathing. That's taking a short breath taking another very short breath and then breathing out for even longer. And we're talking like, I don't know, if you breathe in for a, a count of like 10, breathing out for like a count of 40 or so, it's it, very difficult to do. Um, really some great studies showing that over a period of time, this helps not only with calmness, but with elevated mood for a long period of time. So there's a lot of really great apps and whatnot to help prompt you for cyclic breathing. Also being social and getting together with people that you enjoy, that helps bring down those cortisol levels and keep you calm. Progressive muscle relaxation is another really good one where you tense your muscles slowly, starting from the top of your head and working your way down to the bottom of your feet and you tense them and then you let them go so that you're able to also recognize the difference between tense and calm. Um, but we tense them and then we hold them so that we feel it and then we, we let them go. So we do that progressively throughout the body. Oh, my chuck it bucket. Look, so you take all the information and all the stuff that's bothering you, you put it in your chuck it bucket and you throw it out. And once it's in there, it's in there. You don't have to worry about it because it's in your chuck it bucket. And every time it bothers you, you put another piece of paper in. But it's about throwing away all of those thoughts so that they're not staying in your head rattling around. It's okay to have them and it's okay to chuck it. Music. We know for years that music is a wonderful way to help change our mood and shape our mood. There's nothing wrong, again, with plugging in, getting music that you like, and kind of tuning out. There are lots of different grounding text techniques. Also, ACE is another one. Um, five things you can hear, four things you can see, three things you can feel, two things you can touch, uh, one thing you can, I'm missing one, uh, but five, four, three, two, one. And so it's a grounding technique to kind of bring you back into, instead of your head and all those thoughts that you're engaged with, into the real world and into the physical senses. So those grounding techniques are very, very helpful. And again, going back to what Chris mentioned and what I had mentioned earlier, communicating with those who understand what you're going through. So you're not alone. And the more you see that you're really part of a community, the better you'll feel. So th thanks for my quick presentation and I'll be able to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks, Dr. Abby. Um, we were gonna go first with some 
pre-questions, but we've had some good questions come in, especially around communication. I know that was a key portion and, and that's so important, especially if you're a host or if you're traveling somewhere, that communication is, is, is vital. Someone mentioned that communicating their needs makes them feel awkward and it makes them feel needy. So how would you recommend that they rethink that? Hmm. You don't have to listen to every feeling. It's just a feeling. It doesn't mean that it's truth. It doesn't mean that there's a really great technique in mindfulness and in meditation. And it's called noting where just because a thought pops in your head, you don't have to answer it. You just kind of note what it is. Oh, that's a thought. And then you kind of go back to what you were doing. You might have a thought or a feeling that you feel needy or you feel this, but it doesn't mean it's true and you don't have to own it. You can just say like, that's just a thought. But you know, like I know, like you know, this is my health and I can't compromise that. That's not being needy. That's making sure I'm safe. And so if you have to channel somebody that you admire, like there's another psychologist I admire who is, oh, she's the epitome of a lady and she's so sweet. She's so nice and she's so firm and strong. I'm so not, like I'm, I'm a little snarky and obnoxious. And if I can channel her and be sweet and kind and firm, I will, right? Find someone you can channel and emulate them, but you're keeping yourself safe. That's not being needy. Okay. That's good. So there are questions that we did receive in, and I think you covered a lot of this, but these are, I think we, it's good for us to go back through here and associate them with the real life experiences and the questions that people are going through. And so I think, you know, we'll start off with, as we're planning for this, you know, my first question was somebody wrote in, this is their first holiday season uh, with celiac disease. They had a daughter who was diagnosed in August. How do you recommend not getting overwhelmed when getting started? Yeah, I would plan a menu, especially with your daughter. You said she's nine? I believe so, yes. Yeah, yeah. If, if she's old enough to be able to tell you what she likes and doesn't like and to have her help and be involved. So this way she knows what is gluten-free, what's not gluten-free, what's good for her, what she likes, what she doesn't like. Teach her how to cook, get her involved. Um, but if you can plan a menu, you'll, again, what do you have control over? What do you not have control over? You'll feel better and she'll feel better. Okay, good. I forgot to mention too, please, if you have questions, we're going to get to the questions that come in live as well. So again, QA box at the bottom. I'll go ahead and uh, put those in there. Uh, another question that we had that came into us was um, somebody's avoided family functions due to their gluten sensitivity. So they're looking for a way to deal with new circumstances and to enjoy life. Um, any advice for her? I know you put a lot of things up there of how to deal with stress, but you know, how does that, uh, what would you recommend for her? Oh, go enjoy life. There's so much that you can do. There's no reason that you should step back from doing things because you can't eat what other people are eating. If that means that you have to bring your own food. Um, I remember for my kids, I would say, what is everybody bringing for uh, birthday parties in school? And I'll make the same exact thing. So if it was a chocolate cupcake with vanilla frosting, my kids had a chocolate cupcake with vanilla frosting mm -hmm. so that they could be part of the group, but don't exclude yourself. So definitely take that step. If, if it means that you have to either buy the food or you have to make the food yourself, again, figure out what you have control over and what you don't. Be okay mm -hmm. with letting go of the things that you don't have control over and working with yourself to handle the things that you do so that you can enjoy life. Yeah. And I think empowerment, that's, you know, that's in our mission at NCA. And I've always talked about empowerment and making sure that you are your own advocate. You can speak up for yourself. Be proud of who you are. Yes. This is a scenario that, you know, you got dealt, but it's the lemons out of, lim you know, lemonade out of lemons kind of thing. And, and really don't let it, you know, be who you want to be um, and, and, and find those ways to, to make it through. So, yeah. yeah, this doesn't have to stop you. Yeah. Right. So I'm going to switch now to a question about somebody who's hosting. So again, the stress can come from the host side of these things as well. So this person, let's see, they're Thanksgiving hosting for a family of 15. And so they have a newly diagnosed granddaughter. They're going to be attending. Um, the foods are going to be gluten-free, uh, but she's interested in tips that might use uh, that they might be able to use to help navigate the day successfully. They don't want any of the family members to feel different or feel left out. 
really, again, it's all about communication. So the the child who is gluten-free, here's what you can have. You know, is there anything else you need? No, as long as that person knows and they're comfortable and the hosts are calm and comfortable, everyone else will be as well. If they don't allow things to rise to the level of a freak out and, and a big stressful situation and they have it under control, nobody else is going to let it, their arousal level rise as well either. And I would think the earlier the communication, the better in these situations, correct? I mean, you're coming up, you know, we're, we're a week out right now and yeah. you're already buying stuff and you're already trying to plan it in your head. So that earlier communication is just going to be more helpful. If you can do it before Halloween, that might be best because Halloween's a little wacky and crazy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would say mid-October. But honestly, listen, if you do it the day before, you do it the day before. You're sorry. Next year, you'll do it a little sooner. You still want to be there. It's the day before. How can you make this work? And you could also figure it out. And, and I was just thinking, you know, you have Thanksgiving and four or five weeks later, you get into the holiday season and other holidays, you know, throughout that course of December. So that may be a, you know, if it didn't work out before you didn't com communicate before, maybe this is how you can learn from that and continue and make better experiences as you go on. Absolutely. Because everything that you learn from Thanksgiving, you're just, you're not going to forget it, right? You're just going to take and move on for the rest of the holidays. Right. So it, it's all about moving forward. Okay, good. So I've um, got another person who is their first holiday since diagnosis, uh, and their family seems to flip-flop between understanding that they have a serious medical diagnosis or ridiculing them because of their dietary restrictions. So what are what can they do? They're going to bring their own food. Um, they're going to the gatherings without uh, somebody. They said they're going alone. So what can they potentially do in those situ situations where someone does, doesn't believe or understand what the diagnosis is? Um, practice like golf laughs and ha, ha 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 you know and walk away right whatever like oh, it snarky responses whatever you don't have to be privy or take somebody else's obnoxious comments but nor do you have to get so offended and respond and react if people are going to be obnoxious you can kind of just laugh and be like whatever and then just walk away it, you know what you're doing you know what works for you and that's kind of where it ends. You don't, you don't have to go any further with something like that. Yeah. You don't have to explain anything. You don't, they're, they're not the boss. So I'm going to dip into the live question pool again, because I think we're on this topic of, you know, people feeling alone and having these emotions when people. Oh no. We lost Chris. Oh no. We'll give it just a moment, I think. Do you know the question he was going to ask? Here oh, I am. There you oh, are. <laughs> Sorry, I dumped off there. So, okay, I'll go back. Um, Being alone. Not sure what, what happened there. Apologies. Again, can't plan these things. Can't be stressed out about it. It's just going to happen what's going to happen, right? So we're talking and, and we're on the emotions of, of the holidays and, and being alone, et cetera. And so somebody had said that, you know, they're, they're watching other people eat that holiday food and they miss, it makes them sad. Sometimes they have to have good, a good, have a good cry. You know, is there a way to conquer that sadness that when watching these non-celiac people eat the food, you know, it, that brings them the sadness? How do they conquer that potentially? Oh, there's a great Irish saying about um, sadness being upon me. And I don't remember the full saying, but it's something like sadness is upon me. You don't have to, be sadness you could just kind of have sadness on you knowing that later on something else will be on you too so you don't have to own it right it, it's it's not who you are it's kind of the feeling that you have now um super quick like therapy in 2.5 seconds um i tell people that if you don't feed the thoughts they go away in 90 seconds so oh that sadness it's just a feeling i feel it and then focus either on the feeling or just focus on the breathing or anything else, but you don't have to continue talking to the thoughts and talking to the feelings and feed it. It's okay to be sad that you miss pizza or you miss bagels or you miss, you know, those really yummy Italian cookies. It's okay. It's okay. And, and then we move on, 
right? But we don't have to feed the thoughts and fall down that rabbit hole. Yeah. Okay. Um, any any tips? I know we've talked about it, and I think this goes back to the just the the, the little laugh and the little okay, blow it off. But I had somebody who said their host isn't cooperating with the steps necessary to serve gluten free food safely, and it makes them feel left out, makes them feel anxious. Um, I, I would think we're going right back to the you know what it's you can control what you can control in that scenario. Yeah. So if you really want to be there and it's important for you to be there, which, which is awesome, bring your own food, bring your own utensils. You got this covered. Don't worry about it. And, and then you don't have to worry about being sick. You can just enjoy being with people who, who you enjoy being with and you've got the food covered. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I do that all the time. I know my mom and I do that. We, we come with our little bags of food and wherever we go and whether people has food for us or not, it doesn't matter because we know we are covered. And so everything else is secondary. Great. So here comes one of the most frequent questions that we got. And this came in so many different forms, but it's all kind of the same question. It was, you know, how can I graciously decline gluten-free food just made just for me? You know, and it's one of those ones you're not comfortable eating. Um, they're very fortunate. People have been supportive and they make it, but you don't trust their ability to cook safe food. How do you navigate that type of a situation? You can do like I did, you know, or do with this family member. And we we put it on our plate and we say thanks so much. And then we chug it. Um, or you can kind of be around it um, and just not eat it. I wouldn't make somebody feel bad. I would thank them profusely. Um, and I just, I just wouldn't eat it. And if they say, oh, take it home, you can say, okay, and bring it in your car and go home and chug it at home. No one has to know. So if you're visiting a parent's house, though, and let's say that parent is defensive about it and saying, well, I know how to do this and, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, again, how do you ask those questions about how they prepped it without, you know, making them feel worse about it or making them more angry? Time and place. Now's not the time. Now's not the place. You can do that another point in time. So okay. honestly, I wouldn't, right? Like in the middle of Thanksgiving, I wouldn't be asking any prep questions. If you really have concerns, you can do it with them, maybe at your house. Um, or you can do it with them at their house. Again, what do you have control over when you do it with them? But if even with all of that, you just don't feel safe, it's okay to say, oh, okay, thanks so much. I love it. It's great. Mm -hmm. And then get it out later. So, I, I mean, that's great advice. I mean, it's one of those things that uh, you have to work or worry about yourself and, and make sure that you're in a good place there. And and if they feel bad, yeah, let's talk about it some other time. You know, there's always there's always awkward conversations at the holiday table. So let's not have another one. Right? Exactly. Right. <laughs> so I love you know. your hair. Where'd you get that blue hair dye? It's awesome. <laughs> you know, do that. Yeah. So another one we got that quite a bit of was around cross contact. And the example being, I'm the only one in my family with celiac disease. I know which of the foods my family is going to be serving that I need to avoid already. I'm sure there's still going to be some cross contact in the preparation of the meal. Anything I can do to kind of offset symptoms or, you know, how do you avoid that cross contact during the holiday, especially when you're at someone else's house? If you know what food is safe, I would take it first. If you don't and you're worried about even the cross contamination in the cooking of it, I would bring your own. Yeah. Again, what you can control and what you can't. Right. We used to do so when we had Thanksgiving with my son, who is the one who has celiac in my family. He was a growing boy, but and we knew he was going to take a second plate of food. So what we did, we asked if he could go through first. That way, if any cross contact happened, but we had him take two plates and we had him make his second there, his second plate before anyone else got into it. So we just kind of put that aside for him. And then when he was done, he could have it again, knowing that, you know, as much as people are going to try, there is that cross contact uh, probability in that situation. Right. So, yeah. I was always lucky because um, my mother was first diagnosed and then I'm one of four girls and all four of us were subsequently diagnosed. And then we all have kids and we have kids who were subsequently diagnosed. So everybody in the family um, who didn't have celiac, it was like five people out of 35 or 50 or whatever um mm -hmm. we would have our thanksgiving is like 32 and that's just immediate family and probably 25 of that 32 have celiac so there really is no cross contamination because the whole thing is gluten-free so we're we're in a really lucky 
um, position and situation where we don't we don't have to worry about it. But I know that that's very unique. Most people don't have that at all. You know, when we used to go to my mother in law's house, I would eat my own food, and she would say, "Oh, this is for you," and I would say, "Great," and I would take it first and take what my kids needed first, and then I would say, "We have food at home. Don't worry about that." Yeah, and that sounds. I mean, that sounds wonderful that you have so many people that are understanding. You have a big family network. I mean, I, I do as well. We did have a question come in on the live that is on the opposite of that. And somebody's, and one of the suggestions, they're going to be alone for the holidays. Um, at least the food's going to be safe, but they're lonely. They've had a lot of relatives that have passed away. Um, I, I, I don't know if there's anything we can address with that, but you know, it's there. there's that side of the coin when you talk about the holidays as well. Yeah, and and it's tough when you used to have all these family traditions and now you don't. And that also causes stress, but it gives you an opportunity to create new ones. Um, I don't know where they are in the world, but there are lots of places and websites that you can go on that offer you opportunities to do things during the holidays. So it's worth checking them out beforehand. Some of them you have to RSVP early. Um, it's worth checking out beforehand so that you're not alone for the holidays, be it volunteering opportunities or just socialization opportunities and group yeah. meals. And then if we go back to the bigger groups, I think that leads to, you know, another question we had in terms of mixing families and mixing family traditions and different cultures. That can be very stressful um, for 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 if you have traditions during the holiday season, then you come in. So, I mean, how do we how do you make sure that everyone's traditions and experiences and cultures are recognized, but also provide something that is satisfying for you because it's your holiday as well? Right. The only thing that you can do is try and communicate and it's not going to be perfect for everyone. And again, that goes to adjusting your expectations. It's not the same as so-and-so made it, and it's not what so-and-so expected. But if you tried and you're comfortable with what you did and you're open to suggestions, it may not be how you would have given the suggestion, but you're willing to hear what they have to say. You know, that's all you can do what you have control over. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are, there are things that I didn't grow up with that I have learned how to make that are gluten-free that definitely do not taste the way they would have if they were made with wheat flour. And it is what it is, I tried, it's okay. It's, it, you'd be happy with, you know, this is what we have and here we go, so. Right, yeah. right, and it's okay, I tried. The point is the attempt and and really in, in most of these traditions, the point is being together. And so when you boil down to it, mm -hmm. I accomplished that, I did good. So I'm going to step outside of the the family setting and we have somebody who has a nine-year-old who has celiac disease and they're talking about he has school, they have school gatherings and parties where he's going to be the only one there with celiac yep. um, suggestions for her um, or for, for her, her, her son. Um, I would say first, you know, uh, you know, obviously with 504 plans, make sure that it's discussed with the school and there's communication there, but you having gone through it as well, are there certain tips or things that you've done with your family members in those situations uh, where it's in a public setting like a school or or for your kids? Yeah, so those five or four, 504 plans are super easy, um, typically, and it shouldn't be an issue. It really is covered under 504 because those are nationally recognized um, and they are accommodations. They're exactly for this. And there are ways to create 504 plans for celiac disease that the child is included and they don't feel like they have to sit far away at a separate table, totally different and isolated from other people. Um, if that for some reason had to be the case and it does not have to be, there are ways to still make them feel included with their peers. So I think I agree with you, Chris, the 504 plan in school is is usually necessary. Yeah. Um, in the beginning of the school year, I would stand up at back to school night when my children were very little and I would say, hi, I'm Dina Abbey. Nice to meet you. My son has celiac disease. Please, please, please tell me at least the night before what you're serving for the birthday tomorrow. And I promise my son will have something exactly like you're serving. Don't worry about making it. I got it covered. Mm -hmm. um, and nine times out of 10, I did. I, I got people to email me and say, hey, I'm serving this or I'm serving that. And um, I always also spoke to the nurse and we had like a stash of snacks in the nurse's office and in her freezer of like cupcakes or pretzels or whatever, so that they had them there should they need them. Okay. So they were, you know, if something yeah. happened and it was a surprise, they weren't left out. I, I, I mean, that's that's great advice. I mean, the same thing I think we did with our son. You just let people know. And sometimes they forget. And sometimes a teacher forgets. 
and and that was you know us at some point yes it's hard on the child of not being able to participate but it's understood you know that okay this happened you know we're it, it's a one-time thing or it's a you know it's something that we can correct as we go forward so yep yeah. again the calmer you are about it oh you missed it i'm really sorry have you never had a cupcake before no never never and they usually <laughs> laugh and then you're like dude you'll get a cupcake don't worry about it. It's fine. <laughs> you know again i'm sorry you missed it it's not a big deal like next time we'll make sure but if you have cupcakes always and usually they come in like four packs if you have frozen cupcakes in the nurse's freezer most nurses don't have a problem with it they don't take up a huge amount of space they won't miss a cupcake they can just go to the nurse's freezer and grab one yeah that's great advice there so um oh wow time's flying so we're going to delve into some live questions uh that we've that we had come in during the course of the conversation um we have somebody here they have a family member um so as their older family members who think that uh, they're overreacting when they ask them not to mix utensils. For example, they put the butter knife and the regular bed back in the butter, you know, and they don't really care to learn about um, the celiac diagnosis because they don't have it. So, I mean, it, it, this is, again, another form of communication, but I think, again, we touched on this. If people don't, you know, you, you can bring your own utensils in this situation or, you know, or, or just you can mention it and you, you just have to think for yourself in these in, in, in these cases, right? Yeah, these are the types of cases. If you know that things like this are going to happen, they sell those individual pats of butter. That's what I would bring. This way you don't have to worry about utensils, right? Like it's your pat of butter. You don't have to worry about cross-contamination. They sell those with cream cheese also. Throw those in your bag. You'll be fine. Be because it's not worth, it's not even worth engaging with these people about your diet. Engage with them in something else because this isn't, it's your health. I'm not going to fight with you about it. It's fine. This is what makes me comfortable. I'll just say, take, take that off the table. Yep. Here's a question I love because we all have this person in the family. There's there, how do you how do you hear some suggestions on how do you deal with people who purposely try to push your buttons and get you upset? <laughs> trip them? No, don't trip them. That's no. a bad idea. <laughs> um, yeah. Again, like that's that fake laugh and walk away. You don't you don't have to engage. They'll annoy someone else. It's like you would with any other type of bully just because somebody chooses to bother you if it doesn't raise your ire it's no fun they'll go on to somebody else oh look a squirrel i'll be right back <laughs> kind of thing mm -hmm. and i know we we touched on we took that poll at the beginning and we have a lot of people who are traveling i don't think we've talked about the planning of traveling yet and one of the questions is how do you logistically prepare for that when you're traveling for like more than one week and yeah. you don't know if the kitchen available is going to be safe for you. Um, any tips there? I mean, I have some things that I can add in, but do you have anything that uh, that you would mention? You said you're traveling for the holiday. So how do you yeah. do it? Yeah. So, I, um, so we're going to Atlanta. So I looked up a whole bunch of gluten-free restaurants in Atlanta and I, I called them and we are staying at a timeshare. Um, so I know how to clean a kitchen. I can clean out that kitchen easily. One, two, three. I called up. I spoke to the restaurant. What's gluten-free? What can I have? They were really good. Ordered a whole bunch of stuff gluten-free. I'm going to throw it in the fridge, know how to reheat it. Found a, a gluten-free restaurant, a bakery. Bakery's dedicated. Ordered a whole bunch of stuff. Going to pick it up. So as, as long as I can do that and there's a supermarket around, I'm good. Yeah. We do that. So when we usually travel to like beach houses, we would take our own like pots I mean, not all dishes. My wife would make sure that we ran every dish through the dishwasher and, yep. and made sure to clean. But the cooking things that you weren't really sure about, like a pasta pot, et cetera, we would pack that in our car and, and take it with us. Just the, again, the peace of mind type of thing. Yeah. 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 And lots of people do that. Um, there's, there's also ways you don't, you can buy pasta that doesn't have to be boiled, right? So if you make baked ziti, they have baked ziti that you can just make, like the ziti noodles that you can just cook. And so then I can take either a throwaway pan that I don't have to worry about, or I can line the pan with aluminum foil and make a lasagna, and I've never boiled the pasta, so I don't have to worry about a contamination from the pot. Mm -hmm. It just yeah. takes a little bit more preparation, but it, it absolutely can be done. Yeah, yeah. I agree. But then, you know, to follow it up, we have another situation where we have a Q uh, question here that came in. But what if you're staying with your parents for the whole weekend, let's say, and they're in control of cooking all of your food and you don't trust their ability to prepare gluten free food safely? Is this just a matter where we need to communicate with the parents? It is. And sometimes communicating with the parents means um, 
I love you so much and you have spent so much of your life cooking and baking for me. Let me do the honors and do it for you. And then you just bring all the food. <laughs> you know, and, and yeah. if you can't and they're adamant, um, there are things you know that are 100% safe. You can go out and get yogurt. Eggs are safe. You know, and if, if you need to make your own eggs, you can make your own eggs. There are things you know that you can have in that house that will be safe that they can't cross contaminate. Yeah. And I think that's, that's true too if you're family, if you're traveling to other family members. I mean, you can have that conversation with them and, and, and show your appreciation, your love for hosting. But then again, express what you need in, in that scenario. Yeah. 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 Like I'm going to a friend's house in Atlanta um, and he knows that, that some of us have celiac. And he was like, oh, and I was like, oh, no, no. Do me a favor. You just get the regular cake. I got the gluten free. Don't worry about it. And he was like, oh, "Okay, good." I was like, "No, no, I got all that already." So I took care of my side. Everything else you don't have to worry about. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people feel much more comfortable with that because they wouldn't. He said, "I don't even know where to get you cake." I said, "I found it already." I'm so when you bring the cake, cake. When, in that scenario, when you bring a cake in, does he have like an area that's just set aside for you? I mean, or is that something you've talked to him about, or? I mean, with that whole cross contact scenario, if it's sitting next to the other cake, you know, and somebody just picks up the wrong knife, do, does do they understand that extent of it, or is that oh. something you have to talk about? So it's interesting. In this particular scenario, my son doesn't know it yet, but we're going to have a birthday party for him. He's turning twenty, so you know, don't get so excited. But don't watch the webinar. Right, don't watch, don't watch. But um, I'm bringing all of other than the non gluten free cake, which he's getting. I'm bringing all the silverware and everything and I'm bringing the gluten-free cake. So I can put everything where I want it to be. Okay. So if his cake is front and center and mine's all the way in the kitchen, my my other son and I will know where our food will be. So we don't have to worry about it because our stuff is so far away. There's no thought of cross-contamination with the utensils. Okay. Um, we got another question that came in along the same lines of friends and family aren't believing the diagnosis is a real problem. Um, for example, she's, they, they say that the friend told me my problem is all the stress that they've been through. Um, another subtly implied it was IBS caused by an eating disorder. Um, she said, it seems that we should set the record straight on this one. And I tend to agree with her. I think there's resources that she can provide, but again, we're going to have those people who are, who are doubting. Um, and why do I, I think set the record straight? That's not my job. If, if, yeah. if that's kind of the relationship that you have and you kind of want to push it, you certainly can, but. I believe that there are unicorns and nobody's going to tell me otherwise. And you can give me all the data I want and I'm not going to change my mind. Mm -hmm. So you might as well just let it go. Okay. And that's where that okay comes in. Okay. It's all stress. Okay. It's an eating disorder. Okay. As long as they don't feed me, I don't really care. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a great point again. I mean, that's just, you have to keep yourself safe and, and, and your, your mental illness and your health has to be there, you know, prior to hurting someone's feelings. I mean, I, that's what I think. So, yeah. Right. And and your friends will love you and care for you. And it's not their place to diagnose you. Yeah. So, and, you and, I think too, and there's a comment that came in about, um, and, and this might've been from somebody on, on our team here that says, you know, holidays are super stressful. Uh, there's no, po and if there's no positive, don't put yourself in the situation. You know, it's one of those things, change your plans. And you'd said it in your presentation, you know, make your exit strategy or you make your plans. If it's something that's not going to bring you joy during the holiday season, yes, it's difficult to say no or to upset that family member, but you have to think about you. Yeah. You know, how many times have I held a baby and I said, oh, we totally need a diaper change. And I would look at my husband and I'd say, you have any more diapers? And he says, no. And I said, oh my God, we got to go. We need more diapers. And we would leave. Time <laughs> to go, you know, whatever it takes. Yeah. Yeah. So. So there is somebody who also asked a question, um, and this came from online, about coping with generalizations. And I, I think this this goes towards how people think about celiac disease, because you see these generalizations on TV and advertising. There are slogans such as, you know, food connects us, but yet celiacs are left out. Um, I, I, I guess, again, the culture that's being taught, I mean, is that, again, we're in that same scenario where you have to stand up for yourself. And and if you want to discuss what, what you know from a resource standpoint, you can do it, but you could put other things in the chuck it bucket, right? Yeah. And, and remember that just because food connects us doesn't mean we're talking about Big Macs, right? It, it's the general idea of food connecting us. So yeah, food connects us, but it's not 
only wheat, barley, rye, and oats that connect us, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's just in general the idea of the meal and eating it communally and and engaging in that activity together and that warm fuzzy feeling. So we don't have to take the other thought is we don't have to take every saying and every marketing phrase the way they mean it. We can take it as and and modify it and use it as we see fit. Yeah, I was saying, you know, there's there are certain scenarios that you just can't. It, we can teach as much as we can, but you, you know, again, don't you, you can talk and talk and talk. If they're not listening, they're not going to listen. And so, you know, you can again, your own peace and sense, sense of peace. And I think that comes in. We had another question that said at a community dinner, uh, the baker said that the bread being consumed has been consumed before by gluten intolerant people or folks with celiac disease. And the person didn't want to be rude with this, but they did say, you know, I don't trust it. So, I mean, this is a professional in that scenario. Um, you know, they think they fixed something, but again, that's something that, you know, is untrue. And I don't, that doesn't mean that you have to correct him. That's where the, oh, okay, great. Can I have that one? Yeah. <laughs> and you don't have to be bullied. Again, if that requires, I can't tell you how many of my parents that I work with say, oh, I channeled you today. Um, just right? You can channel somebody else. You can channel me. You can channel whomever it's going to be to give you the strength to not follow what other people want you to follow. It's okay. Just because someone says something doesn't mean it's true. doesn't mean you have to listen. That's great. I'll take that one. Or thanks, but no, I'm good. I'm, I ate already. I'm fine. I do have one person that chimed in. Any ideas for a good uh, gluten-free, easy Thanksgiving dessert they're hosting? Um, What's your go-to? My wife makes a great gluten-free pumpkin roll, by the way. But that's not, I mean, she just, she's a baker by trade. So I'm not going to put yeah. that out as easy, but. Easy. Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't make it easy. I make some awesome whoop whoopie pies. Um, oh, yeah. There are, there are like dips that you can make with with like Cool Whip and stuff um, that you can like dip fruit in. That's super easy. So you can look up those sorts of recipes. You can make them with yogurt too. Um, very, very easy. Make them with vanilla yogurt. Someone chimed in that chocolate uh, chocolate truffle pie is easy. Oh, there you go. Thank you, Laura, yeah. for the suggestion there. So yeah. Buy I, know we have, I know on on the NCA site we have a recipe section. Um, you know you can you can look on there. Uh, we have places that have uh, just those are all gluten free recipes. So I, I'm not positive how many dessert recipes we have up there, but it may be something you can look at and and, and grab a quick uh, grab a quick recipe off there if you need to. So. Sometimes buying things and then just like making them look pretty is also super easy, and that's okay. You, not everything does not have to be from scratch. Yeah. You can buy it and make it look pretty, and that's good too. One question came in, um, and and I've gone through this scenario recently. Um, they have a son who's twenty. They're they're getting into dating. A uh, big part of that's going out to dinner. Yep. Uh, you know, very few dedicated gluten free restaurants. You know, uh, how is that navigated? I, and I can I can say what I, I told my son. You know, there's all there's. If you have to eat a salad that night, eat a salad. I, I always told him, you know, don't let your celiac disease get in the way of what you're doing you know don't have it be a don't have it be something that prevents you from doing something that's enjoyable i think we touched on that with like the holiday don't don't put yourself in that scenario so if there's something out there then a, you know a restaurant that doesn't have a full gluten-free menu or you're worried about that there are certain things that he can get that he knows are are going to be safe there might not be a, a wide array of menu but you can still go out in that situation there are always going to be things in most restaurants that you, you can find that are safe um, sometimes it's simply about the experience. You're going to find this true of ballparks also. Um, there are there are some things you can do to mitigate um, getting sick. If it's a farm to table restaurant and the sh you know smaller and the chef uses fresh ingredients, typically they'll know how to accommodate you. If it's a fast food place, you may just want a soda, um, and that's okay. Again, it's about the shared experience. So. You know, depending on where you are, what you want to do. The same is true like in ballparks. I know that there are lots of ballparks that we go to across, you know, the country whenever we go visit places. Um, mm -hmm. And there are things we can eat and things we can't. And that's okay. Yeah. If it's just popcorn, popcorn. Popcorn. There it is. 
by the way, we're getting some great, uh, <laughs> we threw the recipe link into the chat, but um, we're getting great suggestions. There's a lemon cheesecake suggestion. There's a crustless pumpkin pie. Just make the filling and add whipped cream suggestion. So oh, that's, that's not bad there. That might be a yeah. good one to try. So it became a, it became a good, easy dessert chat. So that's, that's awesome. So Perfect. that's what we want. That's a conversation we want here. So um, one other question I have in here and, you know, we have time for a couple more. Um, one is it can be very difficult uh, again, back to other people trying to explain this. And she has a grand uh, granddaughter, six years old. Um, granddaughter has celiac disease. She has celiac disease. She doesn't get as sick um, as she can. And uh, the developmental health is also a big factor in the scenario with the six-year-old. Um, and she goes, it's really difficult when others don't understand the significant precautions are taken, especially for the young granddaughter. Um, having two people of different generations, is that one of those situations that that's that ally that you have that you can go with? But if each of them have celiac disease, does that kind of hurt your ally's cause because that could be the same thing? Or is there more like confidence in numbers? Yeah, it's confidence in numbers. And and it's about teaching the younger generation, look, I, I got your back. Um, and here's what I know. Let me teach you and let me help you. And you could always come to me and ask me, is it safe? And you're not alone. You're not the only person. Um, I've done this before. Mm -hmm. I know so I can help you. And most young kids very much do appreciate that. And they'll look to you. Can I eat this? I remember my son coming to me before he could read and he would just hand, you know, hand me the bag and he'd say, can I eat this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you can eat this. That's okay. Or no, you can't eat this. Thanks for asking. Um, so they, they look to that because they don't know. And again, that's empowering them. Now they know how to keep themselves safe. So yeah, it's, it's they have an ally. They are they are in control of things. Um, your your food is special. With it's with my food. We have like the super special food, and our food is here, and mm -hmm. nobody else can have it. And we've got the cool food, and you know, so they're not alone. And and you're teaching them as you go along. So yeah. That sounds like when I used to play up the kids' table. When I got stuck at the kids' table all the time, it's like, oh, we got the cool table. We get to be over here. We're away from the adults. I mean, kind of the yeah. same thing. It's like, yeah, we're cool. We're good. So yeah. We did have somebody chime in too and say um, for one of our earlier questions, perhaps even inviting a friend over for Thanksgiving um, and you can cook safe food for both of you. I think that went back to the, the question we were talking about being alone, um, you know, and, and just invite somebody over and, and start a new tradition in that situation. Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't have to be something that happened over and over again. You're more than, you know, it, it's okay to start something new. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... So yeah, that was a great session. I mean, the, the questions that we got and the questions that we got beforehand, that was, I, I you know, I can't thank you enough uh, for, for being on and, and for helping us out. It is a stressful time. Um, and, and we know that, you know, mental wellness isn't talked about enough when it comes to celiac disease. We know it's something that affects everybody of every demographic from kids all the way up to seniors. Um, and so it's one of those things that this is kind of the start, like I said, of the conversation. And, and I think you've given us some really great tips, you know, and, and really put us on the right road. So as we travel and as we, or we stay at home or we host, hopefully, you know, that calmness will set in and, and we'll all have a good holiday. So. I hope so. Yeah, I think we can do it. Yeah, and we're so. not alone. That's, that's the big part, right? Even if you think that you're the only one in the room, in other rooms, I promise you, there are other people just like you. Yeah. Not so. alone. But well, thank you. But thank you again. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for answering questions and for everything that you do uh, to support not only our community, but also all of those who are looking to achieve mental wellness. It's, it's much appreciated. So Perfect. thanks. And we also want to thank everyone else who attended. We want to thank everyone for who participated, attended. Uh, we hope that we were able to answer some of your questions. And with that helpful information, you can navigate through that holiday season. Uh, remember, you're going to be receiving an email from us on Monday. Um, that will include the link of this recording, just in case you need to reference back to it uh, before you make any holiday travels or plans. Uh, but please continue to visit our site um, and our social media accounts as we provide updates and announcements for future programs uh, focusing on mental wellness and celiac disease. So for Dr. Abby, for myself, for the entire team here at the National Celiac Association, we thank you for taking part in tonight's event, and we look forward to continuing this conversation with you. So have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Good night, guys.